All right. All right, guys, welcome back to the Rebellion Muay Thai podcast. I know it's been a while since we've had anyone on. Um, there's been some stuff going on in this big, bad world of ours. Today, I'd like to welcome Matt Lucas, former fighter, author, yeah. media mogul, all-around nice mogul. guy, vegan. <laughs> well, yeah. You are in the world of Muay Thai, man. How are you, Matt? Yeah, I'm good. Um, did I tell you I was vegan? Uh, a couple of times. I actually had oh. a vegan lunch in your honor today. Oh, really? That's oh, good. yeah. Yeah, definitely did. Um, I, I try so, and get in uh, my quota of telling people I'm vegan. You know, usually I have to do it about 50 times a day. So, you know, hopefully this will count for one or two. <laughs> hopefully more than uh, 50 people see it. <laughs> <laughs> Kill two birds with one stone. Um, Matt, what's, how, how you doing, man? What's, how are you guys coping with all the craziness? Yeah, good. I mean, uh, right now, uh, Fairtex um, is, the gym is closed. Um, the social media is still running, so I'm still doing things for that. Uh, the factory is still working. Um, Max Muay Thai, where I commentate at, is closed down. Uh, it looks like uh, the stadiums won't open till mid-June. Oh, wow. um, and then it might be like a tentative start. Um, you know, no one's really clear about regulations and what's going on. I think the gyms may open end of May or mid-May. Again, there's no clear answers right now. Um, so a lot of people in the industry are furloughed or um, have time off, uh, yeah. which is a bit rough because, you know, especially for fighters and trainers, um, they don't have income right now. Um, you know, trainers make about, you know, 10,000 10, to 20,000 baht a month. 20,000 baht a month being very high. So I think in Australian dollars, that would be like maybe $400 uh, on the low end, 400 to $800 on the very high end uh, per month. Yeah. So, so it's uh, definitely... So all the fighters and definitely a rough time. Yeah, fighters and trainers at Fairtex are they still staying at the camp or have they all gone back home? Um. So the internet connection is a little unstable. Okay, we're a little better. Um. So a lot about half of them have gone home. Um, and then half of them have stayed, um, you know, because uh, Fairtex does provide housing for the fighters and the trainers. Uh, some of them have gone home because, you know, of economic reasons. Some have stayed because of economic reasons. Or also, you know, it sort of depends on family as well. Uh, so, like, for instance, um, Stamp went home. She lives not far from the camp in the province itself in Chonburi. Uh, her parents have a durian farm. Her and Rod Tong are, you know, picking durians during the, the <laughs> durian season. So, um, and Krabsu, uh, he has gone home to uh, Yasoton as well. Um, I think he'll come back soon. Mm. And um, I noticed the other day you put up a, uh, uh, a little piece on uh, Chano uh, about the Fairtex factory, which we, we shared out obviously on our rebellion stuff. Um, is the factory and all the production and stuff running mm -hmm. as normal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was lucky enough, I got to go to the factory about a week or two ago and do a tour. Uh, I've been there a few times times over my uh, period of employment at Fairtex. Uh, so it was cool getting to peek around with Chano as well. Um, I have an interview coming out with him soon, um, along with uh, some more uh, videos of some of the trainers from America that moved over, like uh, Jong Sinan, uh, Gan Yao, An An, um, Nung Siam as well. I recently uh, put together a video of Bunkard, uh, who is one of the first um, Fairtex guys from uh, Thailand to go to America, first to Arizona, then later to San Francisco. 
Yeah, because you were just out, um, back in the States for a short trip recently, yeah? Yeah, so I was, uh, I did two birds with one stone, sort of like telling how everyone how I'm vegan. Um, I went to America and I was a presenter at a Muay Thai business conference um, that was put on by Patrick Rivera. So he flew me out. And then at the same time, I uh, interviewed all of the Thai trainers over there. So I interviewed uh, Ganyao, Bunker, Jongsan, Nunsiam, Nirapon, um, An and um, and a few other sort of supporting people about the history of uh, fair tax in America. Um, yeah. Nice. So w when was the last time you were back home in the States? So before that had been a year, I'd gone to the East Coast to see some family. Um, and then, but it's been three years since I'd been to California, um, which is where I'm sort of from or spent a lot of time uh, in the Bay Area in Oakland, San Francisco, Oakland. Yeah. So how, how, um, how long have you been in away from the States in Thailand? Um, so I've been out here in Thailand for f about four and a half years now. Um, yeah. So a little bit of time. And you're going back about every 12 months or was there a longer stint before that? Um, so it, it was a longer stint before that. I've been back um, three times in total. Um, yeah. So like when the king died the first time I went back um, for a few weeks, I went to Oakland and then um, last year I went to uh, the East Coast and then this year I went to California. So. so from the time you left and every time you go back, are you seeing a, a difference in the scene, the Muay Thai scene in the States? Um, is, is it developing or is it pretty stagnant? How is it changing? Um, yeah, so there, so I would say there's been some developments, um, mainly it's organizations. Um, so I'd say there's, uh, maybe two major developments. Um, the USMF over the last about five years, um, has really, um, developed the sport a lot, uh, mainly through the kids, um, having like the kids come out to IFMA events, um, especially in Bangkok. And they sort of made uh, IFMA uh, a bit cooler and a bit more interesting to join, which is good because Americans in general don't travel internationally. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, there's not a lot of fighters that have had international competition experience, uh, which includes like, fights in Thailand and then fights, you know, with other countries like, yeah. you know, I, I don't, besides Willie Whipple, I can't think of another American that's ever fought in Australia. No, um, no not on, no, um, not on, no, personally, not on rebellion. Um, yeah. I mean, I've, I've had this thing about getting Kevin Ross over eventually, but you know, as he yeah. gets older and the, uh, the uh, COVID stuff extends and the years go, yeah. it's probably, more and more unlikely, but that's, that's probably the biggest name American Muay Thai fighter that we would know in Australia. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's just a handful of uh, fighters from America that have gone international, um, like Onion Topic, uh, to some extent, uh, yeah, you know, Janet Todd now. Um, but so what we're, we're seeing some uh, fighters go international, um, Americans, which has really helped them. Um, so I would say the USMF is one thing that's sort of helped develop the scene out there. The other is, uh, some of the business stuff, uh, like this guy, Patrick Rivera's sort of business community he's mm -hmm. making, um, the, his big sort of, um, shtick is if, gym owners understand how to do business better. They can build better businesses, which will in turn build better fighters, better communities, more money, and uh, the sport will grow that way. Mm -hmm. um, the USMF is sort of like, okay, we can build the sport by having fighters go international and competing more internationally. Right. Um, I think both are very, very legit and you know, obviously good things for the sport. Yeah. What do you feel like's the um, biggest sort of uh, hurdle 
holding back Muay Thai in America? Um, is it the boxing and I guess the UFC being so large or, I mean, you always hear people uh, struggle to adjust the whole Thai music, Y crew thing, which I don't think is true. Um, mm. what, what do you feel like the, the thing stopping Muay Thai from niching that next level in the States? Yeah, so I think, you know, a lot of times when you when you want something to progress and sort of evolve, uh, you need a very strong culture behind it, um, which means, you know, media um, is obviously very important. Um, MMA has gotten so big because there was a bunch of diehard fanatics uh, doing media very, very regularly for a long time before it got it caught on. Uh, so I think, you know, having a better media infrastructure is really important. Um, you know, obviously, again, Americans are not traveling internationally enough mm -hmm. and not getting exposed. Uh, you know, you look at Australia and Australia has a pretty rich history of, you know, uh, migration between um, Thailand and Australia. Yeah. Um, you know, Riddler, Miller, you know, Parr, a lot of, got, you know, Kaylee Reese, a lot of people have spent significant amount of time in Thailand and brought that back. Uh, that is not the case for America as much. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's one of the things like with Perth in Australia, which is probably one of the strongest uh, cities in Australia for Muay Thai, they're, they're four, four hour flight from Thailand. So when you go yeah. to Perth for a fight show, the amount of um, uh, Thai trainers that are there and amount of fighters that regularly spent long training stints there, it's huge. And then you think, yeah, all the way over to the States and, you know, Thailand is so much more exotic, I guess, to the Americans than it is to us. Thailand's like just a holiday destination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the physical difference is like a pretty big thing. Um, and it is more exotic. People just don't travel as much. I think like even having casual people traveling, um, abroad, um, really helps the sport, you know, like, uh, you know, some punter basically having gone for a weekend holiday in Thailand is like, Oh yeah. Okay. Now I understand what Muay Thai is. Yeah. Um, that is yeah. not necessarily the case in America. Mm. So, um, you're currently the media manager at Fairtex. Um, yes. and previously you were foreign liaison at FA group. Yes. What do you find um, as far as internationals coming into the two camps? Uh, is there a particular group that get attracted differently to the camps? Like, do you, do you get more Europeans to one and non-Europeans to other? Or is it a, pretty much the same sort of crowd that comes in? Uh, I would say it's a similar crowd. Um, I think that, you know, there are some differences in sort of the makeup of the crowd. Uh, FA group had a few was more of diehard um, fighters, um, whereas uh, Fairtex uh, attracts a few, more, a bit more of tourism. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, for a variety of reasons, um, uh, Fairtex is in a sort of a beach town. It's a yeah. international name, um, so it has a little bit more of that tourism draw. Um, yeah. FA group is very small. It's very, very niche as well. Um, so, you know, there is some differences there. Yeah. From the um, outside for a little while there, there seemed to be a, um, a shift in the way FA group, the, the, uh, the, the bulk of the fighters and people there seem to be like, I remember we used to watch and um, uh, Toby Smith was there, Victor Nagabi was there, obviously Pat Bunchu was sort of towards the tail end of his fight career and it seemed like a really strong uh, fight gym. And then there seemed to be a little transition period where we were seeing a lot more average Joes in their training. Is that something you noticed when you were there? Or is it just like a perception thing for us from the outside? No, that is definitely true. Um, I So what happened was, um, you know, they had a lot of, they had people like Toby Smith in there and um, Victor Neg Negby. Uh, and then they sort of left. And then it was a very tight gym for a while. Uh, when I first started there uh, about four years ago, I was the only foreigner there. Mm. Um, and I liked it. Um, I was like, okay, I just, you know, I wasn't working there. So I didn't say anything about 
the gym. Um, and then when they hired me, um, I obviously started, you know, promoting the gym more. And uh, it took about a year um, and the gym shifted in terms of demographic um, yeah. away from ties and more into foreigners. And I would say, you know, now it's uh, primarily a foreigner gym. Uh, right. We'll see what happens, obviously, uh, with, you know, the current economic situation, though. Yeah. Um, as a, how'd you end up getting that job as the foreign liaison? You were just training there and it's, it was something they, they thought that they needed or is that something that you brought to them? Uh, yeah. So, um, I mean, I offered, uh, early on after a month or two, I was like, you know, you guys should build out a website or something. Um, <laughs> you know, it would help. And they were like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then time passed. You know, I wasn't pushing for it because, you know, when a lot of times when if you have money and you're paying for the service, like you don't necessarily want a lot of other people there. Yeah. Um, because it degrades, it can degrade the uh, training quality and obviously quantity. Uh, so as a customer, I wasn't that interest in having a bunch of people there yeah but um as my personal funds went down and <laughs> they, they made that offer i was like okay well i guess you know gotta do what you gotta do um so uh like six months down the road they wanted more money um and so i started promoting for them yeah so the other i guess person from the outside that we know of who's a foreign liaison, but I mean, she's a, just pretty much uh, synonymous with the camp would be Abigail at Sipman Joy, Jim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what's your relationship with uh, Sipman Joy and Abigail and those guys like? Yeah, it's very, very good. Uh, we're very friendly. Um, about 10 years ago, I actually went to Sipman Chai for a month. Um, I fought out of there in a parking lot outside of Bangkok. Um, so Is that with Jared? Uh, <laughs> what's that? Was with it you Jared? and Jared? <laughs> uh, no, Jared, Jared's all talk. I, um, plus, he's not vegan, so he would definitely lose. <laughs> did, I, did I say that I was vegan? <laughs> You're um, vegan. Just, yeah, yeah, vegan. Vegan as fuck. Yeah, yeah. I forgot I to wear my vegan. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I went there about 10 years ago when they first opened up to foreigners. And then um, obviously I stayed in touch with Abigail and um, I see the Simon Chai guys all the time at Max. You know, I'm decent buddies with Willie. Um, so we're definitely friendly and tight. And, uh, you know, Abigail and PA, I've done a lot uh, to sort of grow the sport through the gym as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good people. Um, yeah, because yeah, we've had Willie down twice to Rebellion, once in Sydney mm -hmm. on fairly short notice. Yeah, uh, which uh, that 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 wasn't that wasn't the greatest matchup for him. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, the the thing I like about Willie is that he's always willing to get in there. You know, mm. he he uh, he was not very good when he first started. Um, mm -hmm. And he's definitely hit rough patches, but he he's grinding it out and he is getting better. You know, yeah. um, having worked at Max for the last four years, you know, I see, you know, I see him basically every month fighting and, you know, he's putting in the work, he's putting in the time and uh, I think it's going to pay off for him. Yeah, I think that's the thing I found the hardest uh the most confusing getting a couple of fighters that were max fighters when sam bark came out to fight in australia he'd fought in australia once before and then he was meant to fight on my only show that i've ever cancelled so i didn't get to have him fight and then he went to uh he was in thailand obviously training and he was fighting on max a lot and when we brought him out to fight roy wills watching him on max i was like oh he doesn't look super strong and then he came out and he was such a strong fighter Mm -hmm. And then the same thing was happening when I was watching Willie fight. I'm like, he looks really, really strong. And when he came and fought uh, Ching from SRG, it was like, oh, shit, Ching's like 
real strong. Yeah. And that's, that's been one of the things I've really struggled with adjusting, understanding the level of uh, Max is like Curtis Stady was fighting there. He came out and fought really well here. Then I was going to have Adrian Rubis come and fight Toby. And I'm like watching him going, what's his standard going to be like when, when he comes here? So that, that's, that's been one of the cha- challenging things when you've got no other fight footage other than the Max sort of the Max footage. Yeah. I think it's a bit tough as well because, you know, uh, unless you're in the scene itself, you're not necessarily aware of uh, the matchmaking level. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for example, uh, Sam might look very good because he's fighting like, you know, so-so guys, you know, they're matching, they're matching people up accordingly and yeah. according to their sort of plans. Um, you know, in general, Max uh, matches people pretty evenly. Yeah. Uh, but you know they will build people sometimes and I think as outsiders it can be difficult to go from one promotion to another Mm -hmm. um, you know to try and draw people unless you have an understanding of like okay uh, you know Sam fought this person who I know has fought this person this person this person then it's a bit easier to gauge yeah Um, yeah um, in the last four or five years, there's been a lot more of the, I guess, the entertainment uh, style events. Um, mm-hmm. So Max, obviously, and Max, which went away for a while and it's come back. Now mm-hmm. there is... Uh, it, now it's uh, defunct again. <laughs> we're all yeah, defunct so. again. And then there's... <laughs> we're uh, all defunct yeah, again. We're all but defunct. No, no. Uh, e- even before COVID, it, it ended like a month or two ago. Yeah. Um, how are you finding that I mean, I guess the the thing that adds to that now is one championship as well. Um, what have you been seeing in the sort of the camps and the the culture over the last few years as there has been a bit shift in popularity to those those style events? Yeah, I mean, so there's there's the gyms that have like sort of stayed with the stadiums, and then there's the gyms that have gone a little more hybrid. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's, like, the gyms that only serve, like, the entertainment shows. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So, like, for instance, Max has basically a bunch of gyms that only serve Max Muay Thai. Um, And then there's gyms that are hybrids, like, you know, PK Sanchai uh, or, uh, you know, Pet Indy, uh, where they have uh, both stadium-level fighters and, you know, one championship shows. PK, Sanchai, well, it, it doesn't have anyone on, it has like some people, Stefan Cordy fought on a super champ. So they have like some of the like sort of lower level entertainment shows, um, you know, so it's all a bit of a mix. Mm. Um, so um, re- you've written two books. Yeah, two books yeah. now. And the latest one is the uh, on fighting in Thailand, um, mm-hmm. which I, I, you've sent me a few copies and I've read it both online and in the physical. And I, I found it an excellent book because it, it, it sort of clears, like it's something I'd love to give every person that comes at Rebellion that to watch, mm-hmm. like read this just because obviously uh, we're not exactly Thailand, but just to help bridge the understanding of certain things about the styles, the scoring, all that sort of stuff. Um, what sort of country, like what, what countries do you find when the athletes come to fight in Thailand, adapt the best to it and have a better understanding of it? Um, they come in and they know, and then there's countries that I'm sure they come in and they're still in karate mode. Yeah. I mean, like I was saying before, Americans are pretty dumb. Um, Australians in general, <laughs> yeah, I like your face. Like, mm. <laughs> um, uh, Australians are pretty, pretty smart. Um, uh, you haven't been on Facebook with all the covered conspiracy <laughs> yeah. theories, obviously, <laughs> about yeah. the Australians. I mean, I, I'm waiting for uh, Don Miller to send me my tinfoil hat. But, um, <laughs> you know, in terms of the sport, you know, they're not that terrible. Um, the English are pretty good. Um, you know, Sweden is okay. Uh, French sort of know what they're doing. Um, you know, it's basically the same sort of demographics of where you find a lot of the strong fighters coming from. 
um, is, you know, that population generally knows a bit more about the sport. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, for me as like, uh, I, outside of Australia, I mean, I love watching the French fight outside of Australia and Thailand. Mm-hmm. I think I, I personally think outside of Thailand, they're probably the number one country as far as, uh, style, Muay Thai style and that history of it. And obviously they're, they're one of the countries that's done the best as far as winning major stadium titles. Um, there is on the amateur level, uh, at the IFMA level, there's a lot more, uh, Eastern Bloc countries, sort of Russians and Ukrainians and stuff do really well. Um, are they coming in and just uh, coming into Thailand, training more for the amateurs? Or are you starting to see a few more coming in and hoping to get into the pro side of things? We know like um, uh, Venom have a few really good mm-hmm. Russian fighters there now. Yeah, like Alan Verdi, Rasimanov, um, he, he actually did the IFMA paces and I think he's won some medals there. And then he spent some time at Max. Um, there's a fair amount of... Um, you know, Eastern Bloc guys that come through um, Max, uh, a lot of people like from Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. Um, Actually, we're seeing more Iranians as well. Um, Yay. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But uh, the Iranians more come from a kickboxing background. The, um, you know, I wouldn't say there's a ton of people from the Eastern Bloc countries shifting over. Um, I think there, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is I, I, the Eastern Bloc countries tend to put more money into the IFMA athletes, into the amateur athletes. Uh, so there's not that much of an incentive to switch over to becoming a pro fighter when you're getting a bunch of money for amateur um, mm-hmm. Also, the the scoring between IFMA and um, you know pro Muay Thai is a lot different. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, IFMA and Max Muay Thai are different games, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're seeing some shift, but you know, in terms of like quantity, how many Eastern Bloc amateur level fighters there are, and how many. Uh, pro Eastern Bloc fighters, I would say there's a pretty big discrepancy. I mean, like in Australia, we, the most experienced amateur fighters, unless they're juniors, will have five or six amateur fights mm-hmm. and then they turn pro. Whereas, you know, I've heard guys with a hundred and something yeah. amateur Muay Thai fights. And it's like, obviously that's, it's, that's the be all and end all. You're getting government support to do it or turn pro and hope that some promoter is going to, pay you it's uh the motivation's yeah. different eh? yeah i mean and it happens in other countries as well like uh there's a very good uh fem- female fighter nilly block who's stayed in the amateur circuit her entire career um and every time she wins you know and if my medal she makes a ton of you know falafel you know, for, for winning. So you can't really blame her for not wanting to switch to pro when, you know, it means less hummus. <laughs> it was, um, I, I don't, you know, the fe- uh, Irish female boxer, Katie Taylor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was watching her documentary on Netflix the other day and they were saying as an amateur female boxer, she was still in the highest uh, earning fe- uh, female boxers in the world. And they were mm-hmm. thinking that when she turned professional, she, her earning value was actually going to drop because there was so yeah. much less money in, in professional boxing than the government is awarding her every time she wins a gold medal or world championships. And Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a legitimate, you know, concern. And I think, you know, going back to some of Patrick's things about, you know, the business side of things, um, you know, if we understand the business and infrastructure of the sport a little better, I think we can help aid people sort of grow their careers. Mm. I think that's one of those things. It's like people sort of romanticize everything like the starving artist. And they, they, I think people uh, attach a neg- negative connotation to earning money for doing something. Mm. But it's like, well, if a gym isn't running well, even if a fighter doesn't have a decent job and somewhere to live and have financial security 
they can focus on their fighting. So um, that stuff's uh, so important. Yeah, it, it definitely is. You know, it, at the end of the day, you know, the sport is also a business and mm. people need to understand the importance of the economics of it, the wages and, uh, you know, the economics of it shapes people's decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it's the same with being a promoter. You get, uh, they're in it for the money. It's like, well, if the show's lose money, how are you going to do it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that said, there's also, you know, things about uh, people understanding that the long game of it uh, versus, you know, the short, short term, mm -hmm. uh, quick cash grab. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you know, there is some balance to it. Uh, obviously, no one wants to lose money on things, uh, but you know, <laughs> <ice>. <laughs> yeah. But you, you know, there there needs to be some return, um, even if it's not necessarily economic. There needs to be some sort of cultural impact that is very clear, or you know, not everything is done for hard dollars and cents, obviously. Yeah. Um, other than the stuff you do for Fairtex and um, occasionally, do you, do you do, you're still doing some commentary for um, Max when it's running. You also work for a few different other, you do some stuff for the WBC and Muay Thai Gram and stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I am a uh, partial, I am an owner in Muay Thai Gram, which is a very large Instagram account. Um, we have plans to expand a bit, hopefully do a website soon. Um, and have some up-to-date news, but we'll see what happens with that. Uh, for the WBC, I've just done interview stuff with them. Obviously, I like what they're doing a lot, um, so I'm a big supporter of them. Um, I got to do a podcast with uh, Kevin Noon uh, not too long ago, mm -hmm. and that was really informative, uh, just seeing sort of how they do their rankings, how everything is structured within the organization, uh, it sold me on the WBC a lot more. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, so uh, uh, I have the podcast um, and then also Muay Thai Gram as well. Nice. Um, the WBC, I mean, I from day one, I was with the WMC and the last few years, Kevin's been contact me and trying to get me to uh, do some WBC stuff. And honestly, some of the work that he's done over the last two years and the growth of it, um, that was one of the, th amongst a couple of other factors, was one of the things that uh, made me eventually make the switch over. Mm -hmm. um, in inside Thailand, obviously the stadiums are still king, but is there a thing between the fighters and the gyms about the WBC, WMC, WPMF? Do they care? Or is that just a, it's just an icing on the cake when the title comes? Yeah. I mean, I definitely think, you know, some organizations have better reputations than others. Um, the WBC has a pretty good rep, uh, reputation. Uh, so, you know, if that is put on offer, people are interested in it. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas like some other organizations are sort of like, you know, whatever. Oh, you got <laughs> like a Bangla belt. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, oh, it, I mean, it's good. There's nothing wrong with it, but there's also nothing great about it. We always, uh, uh, a week out from a rebellion, we send out a, online form that the fighters fill out all the details for the MC. They pick their music, do their medical waiver. And we always put major titles one. And I always put major stadiums, WMC or WBC only. <laughs> and every second show, I get the Bangladesh Stadium title. And then the pro record is one fight, one win, zero losses, zero draw, <laughs> Bangla title. I'm like, which one of the major stadium didn't, didn't, didn't come through on uh, this? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm very excited for my rebellion debut when I can uh, sport my Bangla stadium title. Not awesome. that I've won it. <laughs> but, you, you bought know. it. <laughs> yeah, I bought it. I, yeah. Have, have you traveled to Australia before? 
Uh, I haven't. I really want to go. Uh, you know, one of the things about Muay Thai is that it is international. Um, and so I'm really hoping in next year or two to start traveling more internationally. Yeah. So I'm hoping, you know, I can come out to uh, Melbourne at some point soon. Yeah, now that Tim has left me for Chatri, yeah. uh, I don't get to see him every three months. Yeah. I'll need a new foreigner with a foreign accent to come around. <laughs> Yeah, I I can't do uh, the German accent like him, but you know I have my American witticisms. <laughs> America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something That's like awesome. that. Yeah, man. Um, so just for the listeners out there and the viewers, so obviously your book is out now, so people can buy that through Amazon. Um, mm-hmm. I'll try to stick a link in the, that on the Facebook as well. Um, you've got your podcast on fighting in Thailand, um, yep. Muay Thai Graham, follow you on Instagram, Matt Lucas, mm. what's your uh, handle? Vegan yeah, Matt, Matt Lucas. Vegan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> vegan Muay Thai. <laughs> Did you know that I am vegan, <laughs> Matt Lucas? <laughs> um, uh, Matt Lucas BKK. Awesome, man. Thank you yeah. very much, Matt. Thanks for... Uh, putting some time aside for me today. Good to chat to you. And um, thanks for all your help too, man. Like uh, been getting some content for us, uh, helping me and Tommy boy out with some of the stuff for the fights. So I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we'll uh, hopefully yeah. see you in Melbourne soon. Yeah, hopefully. Um, and thanks so much uh, for continuing to do this podcast for all this stuff you've done for the sport. Um, you know, I know it's a grind and I know it's hard, but it, I think it does make a difference. Awesome, man. Thank you very much, Matt.